The biggest thank yous I want to give are to our beloved assistants, three Cuesta students. I don't think any of them are here tonight. They're sick of no. us. <laughs> they deserve the night off. <laughs> but um, Haldon Willard, Melena Smith, and Jessica Alcazar are three Cuesta students who received course credit to help Aaron um, execute the mural on the building. And um, they're, they just constantly went the extra mile. They were cheerful, collaborative, um, they took ownership of the project, and I, it's one of my favorite parts of this work is when we get to work with students and, and really provide this really empowering opportunity for them. So big thanks to our assistants who are not here, but it's on the video. <laughs> introduce Erin formally and read her bio. It's a little bit funny to you know, read her formal bio and she's sitting right here, but I think it's important for all of you to um, get a sense of the sort of prolificness of her practice, uh, how much she's done in her career, and um, what a privilege it is for us to have her, had her as a guest in our community for three weeks. I was thinking earlier this afternoon that it's actually pretty sad that we get to work with these artists and they come to our town and we fall in love with them and then they leave. So I'm sad that you're leaving, <laughs> but I'm very, very grateful and really, really proud of the, of the piece on the building, and I'm really grateful to you. Um, so I'll formally introduce Erin, and then we'll start talking, but again, save your questions as we go. Erin um, Leanne Mitchell um, was born in Birmingham, Alabama. Uh, her work centers black futures, finding solace in her southern matriarchal family. Her work propels black people into a space and time that enables them to live authentically free. As a continuum of those who came before and those who will come after, Mitchell delivers messages of a brighter future in the black experience. Erin Leanne Mitchell attended the School of the Art Institute of Chicago, receiving her Bachelor of Fine Arts in 2011 and a Master's in Art Education from Columbia College in 2016. Mitchell works in a variety of media, including painting and collage. In 2020, Mitchell was included in a group exhibition, All Things Bright and Beautiful, at the Birmingham Museum of Art alongside Amy Sherald and Carrie James Marshall. Mitchell's work has a robust following and has even been featured on the nationally syndicated television show, Empire. Mitchell was recently commissioned to create a portrait to honor Dr. Angela Y. Davis's prolific humanitarian achievements that now lives in Angela Davis's home. So, hooray. Um, we thought we'd begin um, by, and let's see if this clicker works, yay, yay. <laughs> by having Erin just chat a little bit about, um, about some of the artists who inspired, inspired the work. Sure thing. Hello. Hi. It's so good to be here with all of you. Um, I just want to say and preface, I feel like I've been working at Chick-fil-A. It's really my pleasure to do, <laughs> be here and be a part of this experience and have uh, um, Leanne and Emma bring me here. And I have stayed here for so long and meet so many wonderful faces who I recognize in the crowd and those who aren't here, I still recognize them in spirit. But yes, it has been my pleasure all around. So to start with that. Um, and I'll just jump right in. Um, so these are two of maybe like four or five influences that uh, brought about the concept that is on the exterior walls of the building that we are within right now. Uh, the first is Lois Malou Jones, who is a black uh, woman painter. Uh, Around in the 30s or 40s, she was most prevalent, and it was actually, she got most of her claim to fame in Paris. So she did a lot of painting in France, and at first her works were more like landscape and very traditional, and then she kind of veered off into this really um, graphic, colorful work that we see in front of us right now, and I feel like I'm very much into the color and graphicness of of her work and it transferred very well into the design that I came up with that's on the outside walls. Um, we see a heavy influence of African sculpture, dance. Um, the patterning also is a big thing for me because I work with textiles in my work in my main practice, so it uh, kind, of, um, kind of tugs at that idea of, of uh, yardage in my eyes. And so that's, it resonates with me. 
Um, the one next, the image next to uh, Miss Jones' work is actually a little snippet of a Chris Ophelia larger painting. Unfortunately, <laughs> how my practice is that I go to libraries because I still believe in books and like books. And so um, I went to the library and the Harold Washington Library in Chicago and found a book of his work and um, it's like, you, you can see it was definitely like enlarged from what it originally is, but it was this little snippet of this collage person. And Chris Ophelia is a um, British black painter and collages. Um, he does a lot of uh, kind of abstracted forms and figurines all in the scope of blackness. And this is an image that I saw in the background of one of his works that just really popped out to me. And um, I'm gonna let you see how that connects. I'm sure some of you are already kind of wheels turning as to how this comes to what we see outside. But this played a big part in one of the um, figures that surrounds the building. And I'll just say that, um, I'll just say that uh, Per Aaron's recommendation, we have a Chris Ophelia book uh, in the shop if you're interested in looking at his work. Yes, it's called Afromuses. Please take a look at it. It's right outside this door on the bookshelf wall. Uh, two other big influences for the work and for my practice, honestly. Uh, Carrie James Marshall, I feel the biggest of all the ones that I'll be discussing because he is also a native of Birmingham, Alabama and lived in Chicago, and currently lives in Chicago, actually. So I feel like I kind of stalked him a little bit, maybe, I don't know, a little bit. But I mean, why wouldn't you look at this work? It's amazing. And if you haven't had a chance to see it in person, I definitely suggest you find wherever he's exhibiting or a museum who has acquired his work because he's been acquired by many. Go and see it in person because it is just, it's tremendous. It's just, it's, yeah. <laughs> so. But this, this piece in specific, specifically is called Vignette. And it was the spirit, really, of it that got me. Outside of him just always being a, um, a constant influence in my work and practice, uh, this specific one is uh, something that resonated because of the freedom and just the airiness of it. I was looking at the landscape and also considering where I was coming to and um, the feeling that I wanted to really encapsulate as far as like this um, before uh, colonization, before all of like capitalization, before all the bills and stuff, all this, just us in nature living freely and running wild. So this stuck out specifically for that. Uh, next to Carrie James, uh oh. <laughs> next to uh, Mr. Marshall's work is Carol Walker who is a black female, um, I don't wanna say painter, what would you call Carol Walker? Installation. installation, yeah, actually installation. If you were to see their work, um, they use vinyl cutouts and create um, kind of an atmosphere within a room based on a narrative. The narrative can be a little, uh, uh, what would you call it? Not morbid, but it can, in some points, it can be dark, and it really, um, edgy, edgy. It, uh, it makes people confront things in their past and really, uh, you know, confront a lot of heavy truths about uh, America, and specifically the South. So um, it was really the graphicness in their work and um, the detail in these silhouettes, because all the work is black and white, it's only silhouette. So I think there's power in that. And I wanted to take the power and the graphicness from Kara Walker's work and incorporate that into my own. So these are all aspects that I uh, was influenced by to make the design that's on the outside walls. Oh, and let's not forget my own work. <laughs> <laughs> the best of them all. <laughs> but, um, actually, I'd, um, I'd finished this work, oh, maybe it's like a month or so before I came here. And um, I've been working in this vein of these female figures who were running freely. Um, I was considering them, they're having uh, autonomy of their own body. They're 
reaching, they have a goal, they're moving forward, there's this motion that's very evident in them. They have power, um, whether they're lost or not doesn't seem to be the case. I think it's just the focus of where they're headed. And so this is also uh, part of the library of influence that I use. And I think it just, after finding out um, the story that I really based the concept of the work on, it just um, kind of threaded in so naturally with where my practice was already. And so I guess you want to know the story now. <laughs> <laughs> OK, so here's a, a quick snapshot of the Broad Street. Yes. Monterey. Monterey side. Monterey side. I've been here since. <laughs> Still on the streets. OK, <laughs> but this is the Monterey side. So um, the story of Calafia is based in like a 15th, 16th century novel. Um, and Calafia is described as a black Amazon warrior queen who rules over what we now know as California. So basically, it's kind of mythology of where the name of California originated from. And um, I see the story as more than fiction because knowing the tendencies of the country that we live in, uh, most black history is not recorded or taken or taken seriously or put, you know, recorded and studied in a way of serious thought. And uh, I believe if you were to look up this novel, which the title is passing me, <laughs> um, it would seem that this very well could be something a part of real history. Um, and I take it as history. Um, it also, as you saw from the previous uh, slide, ties into the work that I was already creating of these women who are running freely, these black women who are running freely and powerfully through space. And um, with that, just learning about the story, which uh, my friend who is here, I put them on blast, but uh, they really introduced the story to me and uh, it just kind of opened my eyes in ways because honestly, i would not known of any black history in the West outside of like the LA riots and things and that's very much connected to the black civil rights and where I'm from and I know that by heart, but Outside of that, I really had no registry of black history, specifically in this region. And I wanted something that would connect to the area, but it was difficult to find here. And so I ended up having to think more broadly, just in the term of California altogether. And um, when my friend Tori um, brought this story to my attention, I was like, this is amazing. I did not know about this. and. Chances are, everybody that I'm, the place where I'm going to probably don't know about this either. And I'm just curious how many by show of hands knew about this. Just really curious. You already knew about it. That's three people I see. Only three? I see three hands. Wow. So that's awesome. We're all learning here, which is the goal. <laughs> and so um, I feel really honored to be able to bring the story here and um, kind of uh, depicted in the way that it should be, because as the next slide shows, <laughs> there are there have been depictions of Calafia before, but they do not reflect her in my image, or in an image that resonates with me and that I feel is black and is female, and um, is a representation of the blackness that I know. And so these, in my research after finding out about the story, I just wanted to know like where was this like I. I'm a Virgo, very type A Virgo. I want to know all the information about everything, like so I have the facts right. Um, so this is what I found. Um, this last one, you probably all have a box of this in your refrigerator right now. When you go home, <laughs> this is yeah, this is this is not what exactly it is. Anyways, um, this is a dairy farm, clearly, and that woman does not look black to me. <laughs> um, but. This is their logo, and the stories, they very much go by the same story. It's a little edited and omissive in places, but yeah, overall it's that, but not. Um, the image right above that that's kind of cut off, this is at a state building in the city, uh, not in the city, in the state. I can't, I can't, I don't know exactly who did that one, but I do know who did these other ones. The one in the center is by Diego Rivera, 
And that one is called Allegory of California. And that is at the City Club in San Francisco. Um, the one right, to, to the left, to the right, I don't know. Yesterland? Yesterland, there we go, thank you. That one, it was actually an exhibit that was a part of Disneyland from like 2001 to 2008, and then it was closed down. Surprise. Um, but I, the imagery of it, I was really drawn to, because I mean, there was, that's the actual reputation that I would like be drawn to, and it was narrated by Whoopi Goldberg, too. So there, they had something going, but it wasn't enough to keep going, and we know why. But the one at the bottom, this is a mural that is still in existence. It's by Lucille Lloyd, and it is at the State Building. It's called California's Name. And in the center, I'm gonna stand up really quickly, just so I can point out. If I was a teacher, I'd be like, okay. But this is uh, the representation of Calafia in the middle, and in my opinion, it looks very Aztec. It does, again, does not look black. It looks more indigenous than black to me. And so, in sum, to say, none of these look like black women. None of these give me what I feel um, closeness to. They are not the representation that I would imagine in the story that I was reading and kind of found out about. So I wanted it to not reflect any of this, <laughs> basically. But um, what's the next slide? Oh, so here we are. Um, back to the mural that's right outside. So as you see, these kind of very hieroglyphic looking, um, very language-like figures are from that chrysophily cutout. Um, I kind of built the body out a bit more, and I was what really uh, attracted me to that figure were the legs and the feet more specifically because I'm thinking of this Amazon tribe who ran the land, who ruled this over this area, and I'm thinking feet and footprints and what we relates presence being and acknowledging the existence of presence somewhere. And I'm also thinking of um, the first footprints on the moon and like what do we describe as being first and you know the origin of that. So I want this to be a four-footed um, figure and I like the fact that it looks like it could be language. I like that it also looks like it could be a, a guardian or some type of protector of this building and I saw it as kind of um, as a portal to take us back to the time of Calafia and so um, the foliage that's on in the second image is just a reference to the land before it was basically kind of torn apart and <laughs> where we are now. Um, also just to kind of put you in the space of entering into another world and this being uh, something that's kind of hidden, but also very much not because you can't deny these colors. Like they pop out, like, you know, they catch your eye at any point. So you can't um, not pay attention to it. But to also reference the fact that it had been hidden and this is a hidden history that needs to be revealed. This is another shot of that long wall. I think it's great to look at it again, just to um, connect it to my personal work that I had, um, the painting was called What You Don't Have in Your uh, Head, You Have to Have in Your Feet. And I thought at first, <laughs> this, this motif was not even a part of the uh, design. But as soon as I got here, uh, just something in my spirit told me that it had to be a part of it. It told the story more thoroughly and it really brought the sculptural aspect of the building and how the design works around the entire building together. So I thought it was important. These, uh, the running motif kind of sandwiches the building. If you take a look, it's definitely worth taking a full look around, circle around, because it all fits together as a puzzle. And this is on Crotchy. Crotchy. Yeah, I had that one. <laughs> and um, this is probably one of my favorite walls because it connects both the that iconic imagery that's language-like and the feet of the running women. Just to, 
kind of connect both of those things as one. And even though it's just like a snippet of that leg, it follows you around to the wall that we just saw, which is the long motif of running woman. And this leads you on to what's in front of the building. Oh, progress shots. Oh, look, there are our lovely assistants, and you can see none of their faces. <laughs> but this is Halden is closest to me, then Jessica and uh, Milena. Awesome, amazing painters who made this project that much easier. There's you. And there's me, spray painting. So I wanted to incorporate a lot of the techniques that I usually do in my canvas work, and spray paint is a heavy part of that, along with acrylic paint. Um, the repetition in uh, symbols pays tribute to textiles and the repeat patterning. And I find, like, this is my second mural, and I find that working as a muralist, because I basically am a muralist, um, and then working in my, like, at-home studio practice, uh, challenges me in the best ways because at home I'm able to adhere all types of things to canvas but I can't do the same with the building so I have to think of ways to make a dynamic composition something that is uh, appealing but also strong in its simplicity because um, the canvas work that I do is uh, very heavily uh, ornate like you could spend, I, I'll say hours, because I spend hours looking at it, <laughs> but you can really fall into it. And that's something that's not really afforded with you know, brick walls. So um, I like working in this way because it challenges different sides of my mind and uh, kind of forces me to really go back to the basics of composition and how to uh, work sculpturally. We're not progress, all happiness, you know. <laughs> Fun times with the assistants. <laughs> I'm going to ask you a quick question yeah. now. Um, somebody, we, we did a museum circle walk um, last Saturday with Aaron, and someone asked a question that I thought was really valuable, and that is, so that every year the mural changes. So Aaron's piece will be with us until next February, and then we'll have a new piece. And somebody asked about the experience of that temporality, where like literally hundreds of hours of Aaron's time, us working together, our um, the assistant's time, and then it's just gone. You know. So I wonder if you want to speak to that again here. It's like sending a child off to college. I think that's the closest I'll go. <laughs> I don't have kids, by the way. <laughs> but, but it's that situation, because I, I deal with this when I sell paintings, and it's the same type of, like, it's a bittersweet situation, because I'm glad that the painting sold, thank goodness. But also, it's like I've spent months, time, hours, days, in and out, looking and, like, dissecting and perfecting. And at the end of the day, really what gets me is thinking of my retrospective. <laughs> that I'm just like, they'll all come back together and they'll all be a big reunion and I'll see the length of my, um, of my practice and just how I have, um, I've grown and expanded in all of it. So I'm not gonna say it's not bittersweet, I can't <laughs> say that it's not, but I think at the end of the day, it's for a reason they'll all come back together and it'll be even better of a situation to see them all combine. And, and just so everybody knows, we're working on a, we're working on a catalog um, for Erin's uh, mural as well, as we did for the last mural. So um, she selected some really fabulous writers, a poet who's going to write more sort of prose reflection on Erin's practice. And there will be an interview and lots of imagery, images from the installation and final shots in that we're hoping. Knock on knees will come out in uh, May. <laughs> so I'm glad that that's uh, something that's offered because that helps the work live on. Mm -hmm. And it's a great coffee book, <laughs> coffee table book, you know? <laughs> you should get one. I think we just have another happy. Oh, it's us order. eating. We <laughs> did eat. <laughs> that was the most important part to eat. Oh, oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. And then it's just some of your past work. I don't know if you want to jump into it, if you want to pause for audience questions. Oh, I guess we can pause and leave it on one of my yeah. actual, like my work that's not on a building. <laughs> my like actual textile work and work that's what I usually exhibit. And what's, oh, you know what? I should have put that painting that's in the Birmingham Museum. That's okay. 
But this is what's more so acquired. <laughs> Questions? Are, 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 I saw this on your website also. Are they on canvas or how? Are they, they are on canvas. Uh, my my basis is always starts with canvas or fabric. So it's so sort canvas. of a collage. It is. I would consider it a collage. Fabulous. Thank you. Um, when you were talking about working in the studio and then outside, you when you talked about the mural, you mentioned it's good to work sculpturally. Mm -hmm. So, as far as sculpturally, I'm thinking um, more three-dimensionally. My work is 2D, although I guess some people have considered it sculptural because it's because of how some of the objects come off of the canvas, but the building is more definitely so I see it as a sculpture, and I'm wrapping my design around that. Oh, interesting. Mm -hmm. Because it's so darn flat, I would guess. You know, I see, I, as I was plotting where things would go and shifting, I was thinking of it as a sculpture that you would walk around and enjoy. And at some areas, there are things that you might notice and might not notice. There's always different things at a turn. Nothing's really the same, although the palette itself remains pretty consistent. Any other questions? Oh, y'all are easy. Oh. That piece on the left, one of the pieces that are not here, how does that tie into this work? Oh, thank you. Um, actually, that piece ties into this work very well. Mm -hmm. um, so this piece in particular is about um, missing black and trans women. And it was right before, like, tail end of 2019, and you know what happened after that. And um, I had noticed a lot of stories on my timeline of these missing black children, um, uh, violence against trans women and black women. And it just, of course, it struck me because any of those stories could be me. And so um, there was also, there's a companion piece to this specific one. And this one is called Morning Shroud. But the one that started the, I guess you can call it, uh, I mean, a series or a diptych of this is called Imperishable Stars, and it's specifically about a little girl from Birmingham who was kidnapped and murdered. And um, her story really struck hearts in the city, and it got, it didn't get as much um, press as it should have, but in some corners of the world, uh, they knew about it more than others. But it, for the longest, was uh, laid really heavy on the city, and from that, it kind of spiraled into this because there was another, um, another girl who went missing not far from Birmingham. And it just seemed like it kept happening and it was nonstop. And so after I did the one specifically for Cupcake, I kind of did one um, in honor of all the stories that it came across my eyes on my timeline. So all the women's faces in the mirror. This is a mirror and it's like a messenger person who's uh, about to cover the mirror with a shroud. Um, in cultures when people die, there are chances when you cover mirrors too. So you're not focusing on yourself, but respecting those who have passed and really honoring their memory and presence. So it was kind of a way to focus back on what's important and give them honor in that because they weren't really getting it. Uh, they were being lightly like tossed aside and not getting the attention needed to um, actually bring these people to justice who were causing all these pro problems and things. So I think it also speaks very directly to Calafia's story because it's something that was um, hidden, it's something that was kind of taken away, I feel for me, as something to really relate to and grow up knowing, um, I, whether it's fact or fiction, I take it as fiction, there aren't many stories of black women in the role of Calafia, regardless, so the fact that it's not, um, it's not studied or known for that matter, kind of ties into the fact that it was just kind of swept under the rug like a lot of these lives who were taken too soon. Thank you for that great question. 
I see. I'm noticing just now that um, you have the same uh, duafe. Oh yes, here. yes. Oh, you know, and I didn't talk about didn't the duafe. Talk about that. It reminded me. So let's thank you. I'm so it. glad you said that. So um, the head of these specific figures are based on West African Adinkra symbols, duafe, which uh, stands for fertility, um, prosperity. It's a very feminine image and it also is uh, the form of an Afro pig, except this one is turned, if, if the round part was at the top and the teeth were at the bottom, that's the Afro pig. So it's a symbol of beauty, femininity, I see as prosperity as well. And I wanted to add that specifically to the power of Calafia and um, her Amazon tribe. Can you speak to, um there's a few different scales of the same motif around the building, and um, some are very small, some are repeated, some are large. Can you speak to your thinking around scale? Yes, uh, thank you. Um, I wanted the figures to cover the museum as, mo as much as possible. I saw that as these women reclaiming their space and reclaiming their time. And um, I wanted the guardians, I wanted you to be struck. You couldn't, you have to, just, there can't be ignored. It's something that can no longer be ignored. It's something that you have to confront and you have to like speak within yourself about. And while doing this, I did have a couple onlookers who um, asked me where the white was. And yeah, 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 yeah. Could you imagine looking at something and not seeing yourself in it? <laughs> Could you imagine? <laughs> I already know. <laughs> I, I don't say it because I already know. But that just goes to show that mindset, that mentality, and that has nothing to do with me. Because that's nothing that I can change. That's inner work that needs to be done within themselves. But at the end of the day, I know the work is doing what it needs to do. So, um, but yes, I had those questions. And honestly, it kind of tickled me. <laughs> because, come on now. Um, but yeah, the skill is very important to me and I wanted the running women specifically to be larger than life so it shows, uh, it reflects on them being Amazons and this really powerful stance and you have to look up at them and kind of register your size to them. And so, yeah. And of course, the repetition is um, leans back to fabric and patterning. Mm -hmm. Do you have a question? Yeah, a question back here. So, thank you, number one, for sharing and hearing a little bit more about your process and the story of this. Can you talk to maybe some specific moments that, as an artist, you felt as you're embodying this story? Did you feel moved as an artist, or maybe even some times of like as you're in the process of that? Um, yeah, maybe even speaking to how that how this process has affected you? Oh yeah, yeah, for sure. Great question. Um, I think, if anything, I kind of reflected back on how my practice is growing. Because when I, uh, when I left Chicago, my one goal was coming back home was like, I can't leave home again without like leaving some mark somewhere or something large scale somewhere because I need something to like leave a marker. And in now doing mural work, I see myself and my practice growing in ways that I didn't really imagine. And I was kind of threatened by at first because I mean, buildings are huge. <laughs> and that's way more space than I usually do. I mean, I do fairly large paintings. Like, the average size of my paintings is like five by five feet. So it speaks to like, it's the size of me. It speaks to like, you know, my presence in spaces and in um, galleries, museum spaces where most black women's work or women's work in general isn't really around. Um, so I think doing this, I, I was proud of myself every way of it. Um, I'm super proud of myself now. And I think everyone who came past and just kept telling me like how good it is, how happy they are to see it, how the colors make them feel, like outside of, you know, whatever that whiteness was. But um, 
Yeah. Um, it just validated my presence here and what I'm doing and this direction, like being really reaffirming and like, yeah, you you are muralist. Like you do these things. You can do um, like work that's more detail oriented and combines other mediums or you can do very like uh, limited work that's just paint on buildings, but you have that design factor within you and it can transfer and many ways and sometimes I get stuck thinking that like I can only do one thing but I can do multiple things pretty much anything I put my mind to did you in in process did you change things oh like the design yeah oh yeah and you know <laughs> I asked Emma I was like should we show them what it was <laughs> but it doesn't matter. This is way better. This is so much better. But like, oh yeah, it definitely changed. <laughs> it most definitely changed. Um, but now I want to see the book. No, you don't. No, you don't. Well, I'm gonna be honest. This image, this specific figure, did not change. That was something that maintained. Also, can we get a close up of that wall over there, like the super repeated one? Do we have a close up of that somewhere? <laughs> well. That was enough of it to see kind of in that yeah. corner, though. That one did not change at all, either. This wall was not going to look like this. <laughs> uh, the Running Woman wall did not exist at all when I first came. It did not exist at all. I went, as soon as I got here, I was like, yep, that's what I'm going to do on that wall. I already see it. And, so, and then it was. <laughs> but very often, things change kind of overnight. <laughs> and Emma and like Leanne and some others would show up and be like, oh. You changed it. I'm like, yeah. yeah. <laughs> well, it was interesting. I mean, it was, uh, speaking frankly, as a curator and for us as a museum, it, it really made me realize that we have to have our muralists come out for site visits because it's very hard. This is a pretty unique and funky building with a lot of different funky wall. It's not like four walls, you're done. And so... And um, we tried to like send videos and like. Oh yeah, I did this while I was in Alabama. <laughs> and, <laughs> and all of this was done over the internet. <laughs> yeah, like we had weekly Zooms and tried to help her understand the scale and like the nuances of this building. And um, and then she got here and was like, oh, like it was initially mostly this motif yeah. and repeated in different ways on each wall. Um, and and. Um, I don't want to speak for And you, then I was but... like, that's boring. <laughs> <laughs> and so I was like, well, since I'm here and I know what's going on, I'm going to change it. And so um, actually that running, yeah, I showed you that running woman like very briefly. Yeah, but yeah. like she came back super fast, clearly. <laughs> <laughs> she came running back to the present. So, uh, and I'm so glad because like I, yeah, I wouldn't have been happy with the other one. Yeah, and I mean, it was um, the, all the all the mural projects and most all public art projects, little known fact, um, in the city have to go through a jury process. So we have you know business owners and local residents who sit on those juries and um, and get to offer feedback or approval and um, and so we went back to the jury because it was such a significant departure from their original motif. We went back to the jury and re, you know took a vote, you know, is everybody cool with this? And of course, everybody's cool with it. <laughs> but um, so I, I think even that, the collaboration that was involved in, um, in it, I think is interesting and important because I think everybody has a sort of sense of ownership of it. Yeah. yeah. Um, do you want to talk a little bit about the floral, um, <clears throat> like the poppy? You already mentioned that, right? Oh, I didn't mention the poppy. I mean, I thought of the poppy because, of course, that's like the state flower. So, I mean... And that's what the name is <laughs> based on the origins. I didn't want to overdo it, though, because I feel like it's its own very special moment. So when you see it, it's just kind of like a, <gasps> OK. And it's orange, which is the most different color of like the three or four main colors you see everywhere. So it pops out the most. Um, I had a, a lot of fun with this. Uh, and I planted a couple of Easter eggs around the building. So if you just see something, you're like, ah. <laughs> Yeah. It's well worth y'all coming back in the daylight with a cup of coffee and looking closely <laughs> at each wall and walking onto the deck wall, I really recommend, or have lunch at Novo and look yeah. over at the deck wall. And, yeah. Um, 
Yeah, we didn't talk about the Creekside Wall either, which is this, wait, which direction is it? It's right here, right? Yeah. Right, yeah. <laughs> it's literally a great um, uh, That has the museum's name on it, and that that space is really difficult to Oh, it's to treacherous. Paint. It's treacherous. <laughs> it's treacherous. <laughs> because there's no, it's sloped, and there's no platform, and you can't really position a ladder even no. on that wall, and... Last year for Juan's mural, we were able to put a lift over, but now that, anyway, lots of factors. Yes, lots <laughs> of factors. But I still love what you did with it. Thank you, know? you. I'm proud of myself for working with that. I was yeah. so frustrated doing that, honestly and truly. Like, it really <laughs> annoyed me with how this wall, because it's really, it's really an awesome wall. But yeah, it's, it's pretty treacherous to work with. But I think what I did do works really well with how it wraps around to this side of the deck and continues on with the rest of the building. So I'm proud of how it ended. Oh, we were considering like hoisting something from the top down, like yeah. one of those swings yeah. that people use for like uh, <laughs> windows. <laughs> I'm like or uh, Hal was like maybe you can like climb down with like a hair beaner or something. Like, and I was like, you know what? No. <laughs> Do we have any other questions? Go ahead. Yeah, I'm curious about the use of color in your work. So you use like blackness, I see mm -hmm. you use lots of blues and purples. Um, and I was just curious if you could talk a bit about how your palettes really um, emphasize the message that you want to send. Yeah. Um, I feel like secondary colors, for some reason, just give me blackness. Maybe it's because like there's a combination of things. It's not just a kind of a primary color. There's something that composes both of them, and it's uh, a shade of cool. Um, I like blue and black. I feel like they're synonymous with each other. Um, and honestly, my like color palette is just intuitive. Like I just have good color theory. Like I just <laughs> these colors stuck out to me the most. Outside of the, uh, I knew the blue and black was going to be there for sure, but everything else just kind of filled in with kind of the vibe and the mood that I was going for. I knew green had to be a part of it so I could kind of speak more florally and stuff, but I didn't want it to be very traditional. I wanted it to be something that was, um, I don't know, just not your average, but still very striking and something that you couldn't take your eyes off of. Like, I don't know if you wanted to eat it or if you just want, it made you happy or what was it exactly, but it just, it's something you can't ignore. The first one's in Birmingham, Alabama. And the first one, not that it's bad, but I just didn't, it's not bad because I made it. But, <laughs> but it just, um, I wasn't given the creative license that I was for this specific mural. And I think of all things that meant the most to me because I was able to do what I wanted to. And in a lot of cases, artists don't get that. Like people are kind of guiding them in ways or telling them certain things that need to be incorporated. And it's kind of, uh, especially for like public works too, cause you know, everyone has to be super sensitive. But um, for this, I felt like I was given a lot of authority in like what I wanted to place where and what imagery specific specifically, even with the jury process, like I felt really strongly that everyone uh, supported what the story was specifically and even more so how I wanted to depict it. So I think the energy was good and they understood, you know, this is something that's needed and that people would appreciate. And I think it's been very appreciated. And uh, I'm just happy that it all came together the way it did. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah, yeah. Any last questions? And then I have a closing question, but any finishing questions? No? Cool. Oh, go for it. Yeah. Be my guest. Yeah. Just curious what you found most enjoyable about the process of creating the building. Most enjoyable thing about this. I guess just seeing it go from paper to building, like it literally seeing it come to life. Because I mean, you're really just going off of faith. At the end of the day, and I mean, like I, I have a, as you heard, I have an extensive history, and like you know, 
I'm, this is what I do. But even then, there's always, you know, like, I hope this goes right, because I'm still picking colors online. Like, I didn't see these colors in my hand, you know, let's, let's hope it goes together. And if it doesn't, then what? And so that's also a fun time, in my opinion. It, a little hectic, but also kind of fun. Like, so how do you work through this if it doesn't work? But uh, yeah, I, I guess, wait, what was the question again? What am I most proud of? What do I like the most? I guess just working through the changes of it all, because it did change, like we said. And I didn't know exactly what it was going to look like, but I just had these like very few uh, shapes and outlines that I knew I wanted to work with. And so I just kind of played with them in ways, in my mind. For the longest, I just walked around the building. Like for days, was, I was, was just great. outside walking around the building. I would building. be sitting in my office, and Aaron's just like, <laughs> I was becoming one with the building. But honestly, in my head, I was just painting it. I was painting it in my head, and then I was going back and editing it and painting it again and figuring out what felt strongly to me in my heart. Because sometimes I, I feel like I catch myself doing things. I'm like, oh, that's okay. But like, no, I don't like that. It's not just okay. I want it to be better than okay. It can be better than okay. And I'm not going to be satisfied until it's better than that. I'm also low-key perfectionist a little bit. Mm -hmm. A little perfectionist, just a slight tag. But I'm learning to let that go a little bit. Because also, when you mural, it's it's something that should be seen at a distance. And so <laughs> working detailed in my fine work, I'm very particular about details. But with this, you, I mean, you know, it's meant to be seen at a distance. So every mark is not going to be the cleanliest thing. And I have to let go of that some. And that's also something that I'm learning. And it's a good part of this exercise in working on a building versus working on canvas. I can't remember if you talked about this, but how did you get come to the image of Calathea? Did, were you doing research on California? Um, so I was speaking to my friend who's in the audience. I'm not going <laughs> to. But I was like, yo, I'm doing research, and I can't find anything like that resonates with me in California. And I didn't want to do anything civil rights affiliated because, yeah, I'm from there. That's, yeah. that's yeah. what I know. But something that I would learn from, too, and we all could learn from. And they told me about the story, and I was just like, that's it. <laughs> like, it fits so well, and I was already making work that was about strong women moving through space, um, uninhibited, and all these things. So it just fit so perfectly. Yes, this piece. This was done before I knew about Calafia and all of that, and it just tied in so well, and I was just like, it, it's kismet. It was just meant to be like that. Actually, kismet is the name of the green. Ah, yeah. <laughs> no, it's the purple. Oh, it's purple, purple is called kismet. <laughs> Sherman Williams gets very creative with their, <laughs> their paint. And well, it was meant to be. Um, know, I just have one comment um, that without even knowing the story of Kalefa, which I just learned about, um, when I saw that mural, I thought it was so perfect for the time. Mm. The COVID is ending, and it's just this oh. freedom is so obvious. And it's wanted. It's like we're we're begging for. It. We really need. Yeah. No, you're so right. I like that. That's a great observation. Erin, as we close, do you want to share what you're doing next? So you're leaving here. You're going back home for a few days, and then a quick pit stop. <laughs> and then I'll be uh, headed to France for an artist residency. Yeah. 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 Fancy. Um, so I'm super uber excited. This is like the perfect send off and like such a great way to start the year. And I already feel like a thousand times accomplished. Yeah, and in, in France, I'm, Aaron will be working on all sorts of things, but she'll also be working on a print that we'll carry here that um, uh, is inspired or reflective of the mural, um, similar to the way that Juan did. So um, lots of fun merch coming your way <laughs> in the next few months. Oh, and one more thing. I also will be a part of an exhibition, the Alabama Triennial, that will be happening in June, actually. So I'll have some work being shown there. So it's, it'll be me and maybe a group of 10 to 13 artists, uh, specifically from the southeast Alabama, even more specifically, and we'll all be showing work. You can follow Erin's practice on our Instagram, Erin Leanne Works. I think it's, it's going to be on the mural signage, but it's, um, 
Follow me. I'm on lots of fun. The museum page and on her website. Um, but I just think we should all give Erin a very hearty and welcoming. <laughs> her over over right, wine. Up, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> applause for days and thank you all so much for spending your Wednesday night with us and uh, thank you Aaron I'll, I'll tell you later all my feelings <laughs> but um, thank you all for being here um, stay in touch we're really grateful to have you tonight thanks thank for coming you. thank you nice.